Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Raymond from Malaysia. Uh, and unlike uh, Brandy, I, I did have jet lag. So he was lucky. He must tell me the secret. Um, I have seven slides today. And I think you'll like me more if I went through it fast. Uh, but uh, I'm a storyteller. So let's sit down for a while and listen to some stories. Um, when I was eight or nine years old, I started this game. I was in a waiting room in a bank with my mother. And she looked very, very worried. And I didn't know, she wasn't going to tell me why she was worried, so I imagined why she was worried. I thought that maybe we didn't pay rent for a couple of months. And therefore, that's why we were in the uh, waiting room of a bank. And I looked across and I saw another gentleman, a Chinese gentleman with a pink plastic bag and um, a roll of toilet paper. And I imagined maybe he's really rich, but he wants to look poor. I saw this other woman across with beautiful thick lips and all the lights shining on it, reflecting back. And I thought, she's really poor, but she wants us to, to believe that she is rich. At age nine or eight, I started the journey of what would become my life's calling, which is to become a scriptwriter, a researcher for storytelling, and to teach storytelling at universities. It gave me the first indication of what it's like to live imagining a world that doesn't exist yet. Three months later, I found myself in another waiting room. So not three months later, three months ago, I found myself <laughs> oh. in another waiting room. I made sure I took the most ugliest picture I could find of this particular waiting room. <laughs> this waiting room, I didn't want to play the game that I've played a hundred th times since that nine-year-old. I didn't want to make eye contact. I looked down at the ground and I looked at my phone, I looked down at the ground again, and I looked at my phone, and eventually I looked at the notice board, which had a lot of articles stuck on it. And the one that caught my eye, of course, was the one that said, how to spot skin cancer. I was in the largest Southeast Asian hospital in Malaysia, in the dermatology department, and one hour later I was in front of a doctor who told me, Raymond, your fears may be valid. We will immediately do your biopsy to see if you have cancer. Come back to us in five weeks, and we will give you that information. Fear has been the human mechanism to innovate. Fear is that thing that comes inside of us when we are disoriented for a while and danger lurks inside our surroundings. And we have, because of our ability to innovate in the face of fear, become the most profoundly advanced species in the world. We really have. And this ability to look at fear and to reorganize it is what we have done as storytellers in the face of innovation. This is what we do so effectively over and over again. We imagine a world that doesn't exist. And slowly we build that world step by step by step. But the problem with fear today is that we think of it as weakness. We have advanced so far and we've become so lulled by our advancements that to talk about our fear means weakness. And we don't see that actually in our human history we have effectively used our fears to transform. Scriptwriters and novelists know this about fear and weakness. When I teach script writing, I tell the script writers, if you can understand the fear in the beginning of your main character, you will understand how to end the show, how to end the story. Map the fear and you will understand how it will end. Because 
all storytelling is fear in the beginning, a problem arises, fear in the beginning, and systematic steps to then overcome that fear. I spend my days taking this knowledge into startup communities and governments around the world. It's a great privilege for me to talk about fear because I think it is fundamentally what has been absent in our conversation about innovation. We've talked about fast and ease, and we've talked about empathy in design thinking, but we haven't talked about the thing that we have used so effectively in our human history to truly innovate. Fears are the raw material for transformation. You see, when startup companies and governments work with us, we ask them to list their fears, to articulate it step by step by step. And then we do a very simple exercise. It's profoundly simple and almost ridiculous. We say, list the opposite of that fear. No one will stay in people's homes, strangers' homes. Opposite of that fear, everyone will stay in strangers' homes. Now find the data where that's true. Well, there's such things as couch surfers. They all, in that world, everyone, everyone stays in strangers' homes. There's such a thing as a, 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 a bread and breakfasts. In that world, everyone stays in strangers' home. Take that data, expand and move and, in, and, and influence the world with that data. And that's exactly what Airbnb did. They found where the opposite is true, the world in which the opposite is true, and they expanded that world. Who is this young lady? Sorry? I will get Greta Thunberg. Is, am I using, am I using spelling her? We can, we can accept that. Greta Thunberg spoke at Davos, and what did she say? Thank you very much for your optimism about my generation, but you can keep it. Because what I want you to do is to be panicked about the future. I want you to feel fear and use that fear to transform organizations and, for, in this case, the world. Use the panic wisely. Because she said so clearly, our house is on fire. Our house is on fire. And that metaphor can be extended to every possibility, every possible industry that you are we are currently facing in the, in the wake of disruption. Our house is on fire. We don't need to make things faster and easier, although we will welcome that with great joy, but we need to make things faster and easier to save ourselves. I went back to the doctors. Oh, done, no more slides. I went back to the doctor five weeks later, and two doctors were in front of me. And they said, Raymond, we're here to tell you that you do not have cancer. But in that five weeks, my imagination was rich with all kinds of possibilities of disaster. I was living alone, I was unmarried, I had no children, I was away from my family, I was now moving around the world, speaking to startups. Everything could have possibly gone wrong. And in that five weeks, I made lists of things that I wanted to change. Lists of directions in which I will now take to leave my mark in the world. But what is horrifying is two weeks after the doctors told me I was fine, the world and its busyness sucked me in as if nothing had happened. We, at ease, as we constantly make things more easy for ourselves, 
run the risk of forgetting what is in front of us. That the real story is the story of watching new fears that we have never seen before come before us and truly meeting those challenges by telling an extraordinarily new story about what it will be to be human being in this time in history. Thank you.